And so here we go. If you got your Bibles, open up to Joshua chapter 10. Man, I am pumped up for this series. See, we're starting a brand new series called Forward. And we're going to be looking at the next three, we're going to be looking at our three vision statements at our church. If you've been through our Mission 101, you should know what these statements are. You might remember them as I say them. But I believe these three, straight, these three statements are perfect if you're feeling complacent in life right now, if you're feeling stuck in your purpose, if you're feeling like you're just confused when you look to the future, everything looks blurry. Have you ever been there before? It's like all I'm doing is going to work, getting a paycheck, and living life. I feel like I have no purpose, and we get into those states, and, and it's vision that will get you out of that. And so these three statements that we have, they're the same three statements that our church uses to when we look forward into the future. Matter of fact, um, you see, in your life, when you're looking to the future, that's, some, that's called something. It's a word called vision. It's so important to have vision in your life and let God speak fresh vision for you. Matter of fact, Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Could you imagine driving a car blindfolded? Could you imagine doing that? I think you would surely perish, right, if you tried to, to, do, to drive a car blindfolded. Man, it's the same way in life. If you try to go through life blindfolded, you will always feel stuck, complacent, confused, and with no purpose. You feel like you're going to work, getting a paycheck, doing it all over again when you wake up again. The only thing you look forward to is Saturday and Sunday, and then the weekend, and then you got to do it all over again on Monday, and everybody hates Mondays, amen? But that's the, that's the life, you see, and, and you see, it was, what's cool, when I, when, I think, well, when I think about this, you know, God wants you to have purpose in your life. He wants you to have vision. He wants you to go forward in life. He doesn't want you to get complacent. And see, this is the thing. Whenever you come to know Christ and you raise to new life in Christ and Jesus has your soul, guess what? The devil can't have your soul anymore. Your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, never to be erased. You are now a redeemed believer in Jesus. So since the devil lost your soul, guess what he's going to do? The next best thing he can do is get you complacent. If the devil can stop you from just fulfilling the potential that God's put inside of you, then he's got you right where you are. You're basically in prison and you don't even know it. But these three statements is something that I believe that you can apply to your life personally and for our church. Because they will help you keep looking forward with fresh vision. And it comes from this story. I'm going to give you our three statements. I'm going to take each week to break one down. But I want to go ahead and give you our three statements and so you know them. Number one is always pray, sun, stand, still prayers. That's what I'm explaining today. Number two is always in action. And number three is always dream bigger. Three statements that we use as kind of like a foundation when we're looking forward to the future and each of these statements come from that story in Joshua chapter 10 we're going to be in that same story for three weeks pulling out all the cool details and what's going on in it because I love Joshua side note for you guys Joshua and the book of uh and the book not the book of Joshua or you got Joshua uh the character is my favorite character in the Bible he's just he's someone who's faithful he's someone who's obedient he's someone full of confidence he trusts his God, and the leadership capabilities that he shows when I read, I just like, man, I hope to be a leader like Joshua one day. That's some, that, that guy right there, if you haven't read the book of Joshua, you should read through it because he has done some amazing things. And I believe having those traits in his life have allowed him to move forward in purpose, and that's what I hope to unveil over the next three weeks is to show you just how special it can be when you are moving forward in your life with vision with fresh vision and with these statements and Joshua you see he wasn't always a leader matter of fact you remember you ever heard of Moses maybe you watched the the videos and the things of, I think it's like the prince of Egypt and the little cartoon movie and you've maybe seen the story where Moses goes and he helps the Israelites get out of Egyptian sl slavery and he takes them into the wilderness and how in the world they do this, they get lost in the, in the desert for 40 years, and it really wasn't a big area. They just did circles for 40 years. They couldn't find the promised land. They were looking for the promised land, but they had been disobedient, and because they had been dis disobedient, they weren't going to see it. And what happens is Moses comes to the end of his life, and he's going to die, and once he dies, somebody else has got to step up, right? you got to have a next leader. Well, that guy was Joshua. God appointed Joshua to be that next leader and to step up, and I can tell you right now, could you imagine being called next up to lead 
thousands upon thousands of people that were always disobedient, always complaining. You would not want to be the supervisor over people who always complain. That can be a very scary task, but Joshua, here he is. Now he stepped up to be this person who's got to lead all these people. And in one of my favorite verses is in Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, whenever God tells him, don't be afraid, but be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. He gave Joshua a promise, and Joshua started walking in that promise. And as you read on for the first 10 chapters, man, I can tell you what, Joshua and the Israelites, they went into the promised land, and they started kicking butt. They started wiping out and taking back what was rightfully theirs with God's help. And that leads us to Joshua chapter 10, where I believe we see one of the greatest miracles to ever happen in, in the history of, of life in general. One of the greatest miracles. And with this miracle, this is where you can find vision statements. So if you're with me, we're going to read Joshua chapter 10, verses 7 through 14. See, right before this, Joshua had made an alliance with a city called Gibeon. And since they had made an alliance with this, there was some other armies that heard about it. And so five armies are going to come together to fight Gibeon. Well, when they start attacking Gibeon, Gibeon calls out to Joshua and the Israelites say, we need your help. So now you got to fight five on two. Could you imagine trying to get outnumbered like that and having to fight that battle? Well, that's what's happening as we get into verse seven. It says, so Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear them for I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. Can I side note right here? Did you know that God looks at all your battles in the past tense? Every battle, every situation you face right now, maybe the things that you're facing in life right now, did you know that God's looking at in the past tense? Because he knows the beginning and the end, and he's already overcome what you're going through right now, and he's already won that battle for you. If you would call on the name of the Lord, trust in him for your help, you're going to see overwhelming victory because it's promised to you in the Bible. He always looked at it in the past tense. So Joshua then came upon them suddenly, having marched up all night from Gilgal, and the Lord threw them into a panic before Israel, who struck them with a great blow at Gibeon and chased them by the way of ascent of beth Haran and struck them as far as Azekah and Makedah. And as they fled before Israel, while they were going down the ascent of beth Haran, this is crazy, the Lord threw down large stones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There were more who died because of the hailstones than the, sides of the, than the sons of Israel killed with the sword. Another side note right here. Wouldn't you want to be on God's side in something like this, right? I would not want to be on the other side having to face this. And when I read this, and it seems so graphic, like, you know, hailstones, probably the size of just basketballs were coming down from heaven, taking these guys out. The Israelites had been fighting for hours. God wipes out more people in a moment than they could the entire time where they were fighting. And it just reminded me something that what you're going through right now, did you know that God can do more in a moment than you could do in a lifetime of trying? At the snap of his fingers, he can work a miracle in your life. And so many of us try, try, try by ourselves, but God can do more in a moment than you could do in a lifetime of trying. So as that happens, Joshua is now spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel. And he's standing in front of thousands and thousands of his people. And he prays this most outrageous, ridiculous prayer that you've ever heard. He goes, sun stand still at Gibeon and the moon in the valley of Ahalon. And the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jahir that the sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day? There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. Today, if you're taking notes, which I hope that you are, you can title this message, our first vision statement, Always Pray, Sun, Stand Still Prayers. Always Pray, Sun, Stand Still Prayers. Did you know that God specializes in making impossible things possible? I mean, we're talking about the God who all he had to do was speak and the universe came into existence. Did you know that that God, who knows the number of hairs on your head, who created you in your mother's womb, did you know that that God can make impossible things possible? I mean, you can't limit him. He's the one who created the laws of physics. He could do anything that he wants to do. He's God. 
Matter of fact, one time Jesus was sitting down with his disciples. He was talking about how hard it was for a rich man to enter heaven. And he looks at his disciples and they were like, well, what, is, what takes to get eternal life? Well, he's going to tell them that obviously it takes him to get eternal life. But I want to show you something in Matthew 19, 26 that he says. He says, Jesus looks at his disciples and says, with man, this is impossible to get to heaven without him. But with God, all things are possible. So not only is he talking about getting to heaven, but look, he says, all things. So from this, when we read this, we know that God can make all things happen. Anything is possible when God's in the mix. You know, literally, there is nothing that's impossible. God can turn that junkie into living a life of freedom. God can lavish someone's heart that seems so far away from God and have them on fire for the Lord, worshiping him, moving in purpose. God can take someone who seems to have a 0% chance of surviving and heal them at the snap of his fingers. He can make anything happen. That's the God that we serve. He specializes in making impossible things possible. That's the God that I love. That's the God that you love. That's the God that we serve. And you see, what's this sun stand still meaning? What do I mean when I say always pray sun stand still prayers? What you have right there, I mean, get it, Joshua had enough audacity to ask God to make the sun, literally make the sun stand still. I'm going to give you a little bit more backstory on why in a second. But he had the audacity to ask God to do that. You see, what he did is he prayed a big faith-filled prayer of God doing the impossible. So when we're saying what does sun stand still mean, what it means is that you would begin to live a life where you believe God for the impossible in your life. Because too many times we don't do that, you see. Too many times we just don't pray for the impossible, but God wants you to imagine more. God wants you to see the bigger picture and the big purpose that he can have for you. So right now, this is what I want you to do as we really dive into this, this sermon series, as we dive into these statements. I want you to think of that thing that's impossible, you seem like, right now. Maybe it's that job promotion you've been hoping for for years Maybe it's that healing that you've been hoping for. Maybe you felt like you needed to open a business at some point. Maybe it's getting out of debt. Some of you are like, I just want to get out of debt, and it seems impossible. Maybe your child seems so far from God, and you just want to see him come back to know the Lord. Maybe you want to see an addiction broken. Maybe you want to see, I don't know what your impossible situation is right now, but I want you to get it in your head. Because everybody has something in them that seems impossible to make. So this man, Joshua, you see, what's happening in this situation, in this, this fight, is they're kicking butt. They're smoking. Even though they were the underdog, two of five, they had God on their side. And they're smoking them. But guess what? Joshua noticed something. Joshua noticed that the sun was setting. And if the sun set and the darkness came, then he would know that they would have to continue fighting another day. He needed a little bit more daylight so they could finish the fight so that's what Joshua saw, and he remembered the promise that God gave him that he already gave them into their hands. So he's going to have enough audacity to pray this impossible prayer for God to make the sun stand still. When I look at Joshua doing that, I, I realize something. Did you know that audacious vision does not cower to the darkness? Audacious vision, bold vision, does not cower to the darkness. It does not. We look at the light. We let God guide us. We let God's light come through. And so, he, so Joshua, with all this audacious faith and this audacious vision, he stands in front of all these thousands of people, and he says this. Look at this prayer again. Look, he says, sun stand still. Do you have that up for me? Sun stand still at Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Ahalan, and the sun stood still. The moon stopped until the nation took vengeance. So the sun stood still. They had enough light, and they finished the battle on that day. Um, I remember growing up, you know, I love one of my hobbies, I call it, it's going to probably bite me in the butt one day, but I love TV. I know some people are like, oh, you should be outside more, but I just have TV shows, and me and my wife, we are a Netflix kind of people. You know, even when I was growing up, I just loved TV shows all the time. I had tons of TV shows that I would watch, but see, I grew up in church, and I always went to church on Wednesdays at 7, and when I was young, you know, there would be this show that I wanted to watch at 7 o'clock on Wednesday, and I would never get to watch it, never. I was like, man, I'm so bummed because I'd be at church, and I wouldn't be able to watch it, and it wouldn't, like, come back on or anything, and this is when I'm young, you know, and, uh, and a few years ago, 
The greatest invention ever made came into existence. I don't know if you guys are talking what I'm talking about. It's called DVR. <laughs> Amen. Some of you know you like your DVR. Now, no longer is the pa- you have to bend to the power of the programming schedule on TV. Now, you can press pause on your remote control. You can walk out your door, do what you want, and come back and press play. I love it. It's probably a curse, too, because we have so many shows I can't even keep up with them anymore. <laughs> I, I think it's funny when I, when I envision God doing this miracle. Because Joshua had this audacity to literally ask God to take his remote control, look down in the situation, and press pause on it. Did you know that there are scientists that still look at the history of time, and they know that there's one day that just stood still? They don't know it. They can't explain it. They don't know why it happened. But there was one day in history where this happened. And there's multiple accounts, not even just in the Bible, but other history books that show this miracle taking place. Man, so much audacity that Joshua happened. What would happen if we were that audacious? What would happen if we would be a people that truly had the faith that God could do the impossible in our life? That could truly step forward because, you see, believing God for the impossible. Now that right there is praying sun stand still prayers. Believing God for the the miracle. And, And the truth is, many of our prayer lives are just so mundane. Many of our prayer lives, we, we just, it's nowhere near, you know, the, the big factor. We actually, quite frankly, pray small prayers quite often. See, when I, I think some of us look at our lives, you had at one point wanted to open that business. At one point, you wanted to start, you know, wanted that job promotion. At some point, you tried for a child and failed. At some point, you had these things that you wanted to happen, but... You know, the truth is you started looking at life and you realized how impossible it may seem and how impossible it may look. And it just discouraged you from believing big things for your life. And so you just got complacent and you got stuck right where you at. You weighed the options and you realized that it might just not be worth the time. And so you're getting up every day, getting a paycheck, going back to work. We've all been there. We've all done those things. And and get to a place where we're so complacent, complacent. But you see, there's something different about faith and audacious faith. You see, you keep hearing me say this word, audacious. Well, you know what it means? Audacious means boldness that takes risk. It's a boldness that takes risk. So when I'm talking about faith, I'm not talking about this regular kind of faith. I'm not talking about the faith where you're like, I'm going to go to church, I'm going to do my worship, then I'm going to go home, I'm going to listen to my Christian music on the way to work, and I'm going to go to my, you know, I'm going to be good in my car. I'm not talking about that kind of faith. I'm not talking about the faith that's going to calm you or cuddle you. Man, the kind of faith I'm talking about right now, I hope to start a riot in your mind. I hope to start something in you so much that you would just see that God could do more than you could ever imagine or think in your life. That that's the God that you truly serve. And with God's help, you're going to lay insecurity and fear in the ground, and you're going to get God's light illuminate the divine destiny he's put in your life that's been laying dormant for so many years. It's time that you walk out of here with bigger faith than you've ever had in your entire life. This is the kind of faith that takes risk in believing God for the impossible. Many of you know I love basketball. If you don't, I'll talk basketball with you for days. I just love the sport. And, and um, you know, back when I was in high school, it was a lifestyle for me. I played every day. I practiced every day. I played every day. I was even in the weight room, believe it or not. And I was at some point a little ripped, believe it or not. And I would just constantly be... You know, uh, matter of fact, my wife saw a picture of me in high school, and she's like, oh, wish you still had muscles like that. <laughs> Dang, girl, I'm sorry. I'll get there one day. And, um, and so I, I, remember, I remember playing and just this approach, right? But now, you know, I got out of basketball. I don't do that more. So now more of basketball is like pick up with friends. It's an activity more than anything. So I'll play every Sunday. I'm not about, I don't have that approach anymore. I'm going to practice every day. I got other things I've got to worry about. I don't have the time to practice every day to do that. So what now, basketball is not an approach in my life anymore. It's an activity. You see, I think audacity is the same way. A lot of us think that audacity is just an activity. So it's something that we need to have every now and then. But can I tell you, audacity is not an activity. Audacity should be an approach in life. 
that boldness, that risk, taking risks, that believing God for the impossible, man, that should be something that you, you do always. And when you begin to learn to live with audacious faith and believe in God for the impossible, guess what? You're going to believe this. You're going to start to see God do extraordinary things on the ordinary. It always happens to you. You know, matter of fact, there was this one time where I was uh, in college and this one of my friends, he looked at me, he's like, man, you just have so much favor on your life. And I was like, you know, I've never seen it like that. But I guess I'd read that book years ago called Sun Stand Still. And I was like, it just stuck with me. I always believe God for big things. Believe God for big things, and you walk in favor. It happens like that because God will answer those prayers, and he will help you go through that. But the truth is, like I said, we, get just, we pray small prayers, and we think mundane, and we think our life is just to do this, and we put to dormant uh, this, this purpose that God has got inside of you, and we haven't thought about it for years. I heard this pastor say this one time. You might want to write this, this down. He said, if the vision for your life isn't intimidating to you, then there's a good chance it's insulting to God. That right there. If the vision for your life isn't intimidating to you, then there's a good chance it's insulting to God. Meaning, when you look forward, it should, your purpose in life should be so big that you can't help but have to rely on God, his trust, and trusting him and faith in him to get through to that next stage. And if the vision for your life isn't intimidating to you, you need to start dreaming bigger. You need to start thinking bigger. You need to start praying bigger prayers. Because the cool thing is, if the size of your need feels like it's too big for you, it's just the right size for God. It's just the right size for him to move you forward into overwhelming victory. And that's what we see right here, man. Bring, bring this prayer up for me one more time. We see a man in Joshua who believed God for the impossible. And he said, son, stand still again, man. You know what you see right here? You see one thing at the top, the first sentence where you see Joshua pray this audacious prayer, and then the next line, you see God work the miracle. You see the, pray, you see the prayer request, and you see the praise report in this verse right here. And this is the reason. This is what I want you to catch, and this is what you might need to write down so you know for a while, that if you have the audacity to ask God, God has the ability to perform. If you have the audacity to ask God to do big things in your life, God has the ability to perform it. But he doesn't perform it unless you ask it. And there's some people in here that's been praying small prayers for too long. And I want to start a riot in your mind to where you start to believe God for bigger things than you've ever thought in your life before. Because his word says in Ephesians 3.20 that he will do immeasurably more than you can ever imagine or think in your life according to the power that's at work in you. That's his power working in and through your life and you will go farther than you've ever imagined before it's time to stop being complacent it's time to stop being in that moment but you know there's there's factors that limit us from thinking big and I talked about one last week I talked about that guilt factor right that guilt is the silent killer to imagining more guilt is the it's like we make a mistake and and it's just it limits us we think that because we made mistakes we don't deserve to go any further in life I remember uh, when I moved from, so I, I grew up in French Settlement, if you know where that's at, it's a little small town, not too far from here, and I grew up there, but at one point I moved to Missouri to go to Bible college. When I got there, I got involved at this church, they were running about 12,000 people, and I got involved with their youth ministry. On Wednesday nights, guys, they had like 1,100 students on a Wednesday night, you know, just a humongous church, God doing incredible things there, and so I started going, uh, learning under their leadership. And, uh, you know, I was just there, and I was wanting, like, me at first, I was just wanting to get involved. I wanted to preach some. I wanted to do what I had to do. But for the first time in my life, I was like, you know, I had to learn the meaning of serving. So I was stacking chairs. I was 650 chairs on the floor every Wednesday, set them out, pick them back up, do those kinds of things. But there was this time I had only been there for a month. And see, since they have such a large ministry, they do what they call life groups. It's like a 1,100 students, and they had about 20 life groups where you could be in a life group, and it made a big ministry feel small, and you would have people. Well, there was this life group called The Box. They were like, we need co-leaders right there. We have leaders right now. We need some co-leaders to, to go help. They only have like two students going, and so how about you go co-lead? So I co-leaded this life group called The Box, and we had one or two students, and it was seemed to be dying uh, is what they were thinking. So I went over there, and I was like, you know, I just, I thought it was cool. You know, I'd been there for a month. I got to be a co-leader, and I'm going to start working and being faithful. Well, uh, 
what happens, like a few weeks in, like two or three weeks in in their semester, the leaders that were, like my leaders right there in that life group, they got a job offer somewhere else. So they moved to Oklahoma. So the, the pastors were thinking about just stopping the life group altogether. Well, instead of stopping the life group, they had a meeting with me and they're like, you know, we could stop this life group because it only has like one student. But if you want to take it over and try to bring it up, we'll give you that, that raise. So me being a month there, I'm already about to lead this life group. And I was like, hey, cool, that's awesome. I had this, a chance I get to show them I'm a hard worker, I'm determined, all that good stuff. So that meeting happens on a Sunday. Our life groups were on Thursday. So on Monday, I'm sitting down with my college friends, and they were like, you know, I'm going to Miami this week. You want to go to Miami with me? I was like, oh, man, I've never been to Miami before. That'd be pretty cool. That was about a 26-hour ride. You know, it'd be a cool bro trip. You know, we'll all go to Miami. We'll have some fun. I was like, man, that... That sounds like a pretty cool deal. Well, they were leaving the next morning, and we got so pumped up about it that we jumped in the car at midnight and took off to Miami. <laughs> On Sunday night, midnight, we we taken off to, to Miami. Matter of fact, I didn't even call and tell my parents that I was going. I didn't call until the next day and like, hey, I'm in uh, Miami right now. <laughs> you know, let them know. And uh, it was funny. I took off to this trip, and I started having a blast, guys. I was over there. I was, like, seeing the beach. Uh, my favorite player, LeBron, was over there, you know, at Miami at the time. So I was, like, going to check out the arena. And then all of a sudden, Thursday comes around, and I get a phone call. I'm like, what's the pastor calling me for? I answer, and he's like, hey, Ryan. Yeah. He's like, you have life group tonight, don't you? I'm like, oh, uh, yeah. And he goes, you got some students at the house, and they're waiting for you. Are you close? <laughs> Am I close? <laughs> I'm a few hundred miles away right now. Guys, it totally crossed my mind that I was starting that day to start leading that life group, and I made such a terrible mistake that I just wanted to, like, oh, they're not even going to believe in me anymore. They're not going to ever give me another opportunity to do anything. They're going to quit. And, you know, on the phone right there, I was just like, you know, uh, I did it. I messed up. I totally forgot this was the week, and I went to Miami, impulse decision. Impulse decisions are not always good decisions, everybody. And I made an impulse decision, and I made this mistake. Have you ever felt like you made a mistake like that? Come on, don't leave me up here hanging. I know you made a mistake like that before. I know some of you are in here made mistakes, and, and the truth is what we can do is sometimes we let our mistake discourage us from believing God for big things. We think that if we make mistakes, God will look at us like we're not capable of going farther in life. We're not capable of doing big things in our life. So we started praying big when we got saved, but we made a mistake and we prayed a little smaller. And then we started praying smaller and we made another break and we started praying a little smaller. And you got to where you're living that mundane, small prayer life because you're letting your mistakes dictate that. Let me tell you something. We can't let our mistakes dictate the level of audacity that we pray with. Just as simple as that. We can't let... The, the mistakes that have happened in our life, you know, dictate the level of audacity that we're going to pray with. And did you know that in this story, Joshua made a mistake? I bet you missed it completely. You got to read a little bit more in chapter 9, but Joshua made a mistake in this. That even the characters in the Bible that seem so prominent, they, they had issues too. They messed up too. And, and Joshua, you see, when Joshua was going into the promised land, he was told to wipe everybody out. He was told that... And Joshua came up to the city called Gibeon. You remember the city he was fighting with? And he made an alliance with them. He wasn't supposed to make an alliance with them. He disobeyed God by making an alliance with them. And now that he's made this alliance with Gibeon, and he's, having, he's now having to fight a battle he should never be fighting in the first place. I think some of you need to catch that right now. Because some of you in here keep fighting battles you were never, ever meant to fight. And it's because your mistakes are dictating the level of audacity that you're praying with. And you've made alliances with things you know you shouldn't be making alliances with. And now you're fighting battles you should never be fighting. And what you've done is you've exhausted yourself. Now you're so exhausted. Anytime you even think about going in the future, you just stay complacent because you're exhausted of fighting battle after battle after battle that you should never even be fighting in the first place. Come on, I know I'm preaching to somebody in here right now. I know someone's getting this right now. That's what's happening with, with Joshua. He went up with Gibeon, and there's a powerful moment that we're seeing right here. Because Joshua made a mistake. 
He made a mistake. And he could have easily, easily just thought, I'm about to get wiped out. Five on two, this ain't happening. I'm done with. I'm going to get completely wiped out. And that's how we feel sometimes. Some of us want to get out of credit card debt when we shouldn't have got two more credit cards after we got the first one. And so now we're fighting battles of more debt that we shouldn't have never fought in the first place. Or, you know, you, you have different issues in life. You can relate this to any way that you are going through right now, but I know you know the battles you shouldn't be fighting right now. Some of you are fighting battles, and you're exhausting yourself, and that's why you're not able to imagine more in your life. That's what's stopping you. But see, if we could have this level of faith that Joshua had, Remember God's promise that he's already given you the victory. Joshua was able to step back, and he was able to still make a prayer to believe God for the impossible, to pray a son stands still prayer. And you know what happened right here in that moment? God was able to turn Joshua's mistake into a miracle. Did you know that God will turn your mistake into a miracle? God doesn't waste a moment of your life. He doesn't waste any painful moment. He doesn't waste any good moment, any bad. Matter of fact, Romans 8.28 says God works all things together for the good according to the people who love him. They're called according to his purpose. That means he takes the bad things, the good things, he, he works them all together for his good. And he will turn your mistake into a miracle. Stop letting your mistake dictate the level of audacity that you're praying with. God wants you to believe him for big things. Have audacity. Have an audacious faith, an audacious vision to conquer whatever is ahead of you. Have a determination that when people look at your life, they have to know the only reason you're determined that much is because you have somebody fighting on your side that guarantees your victory because you do. His name is Jesus, and he did it on the cross 2,000 years ago. And he will turn your mistake into a miracle, you see. I'm going to tell you something, though. It's hard to get past mistakes. And for me, it was hard to get past that mistake of thinking, now, they're never going to use me. <laughs> I had my one chance to start leading a live group. But they would, they're never going to use me. And what I did is I went to that office that day. Guys, I was like peeing my pants to go <laughs> sit down in this office and have this meeting with this pastor. I just thought he was about to grill me. And he said, so what happened? And I said, man, I own it. I looked at the pastor, I said, I own it. I messed up. I totally just didn't even think about it. And I said, that's not the person I am. I know I'm better than that. I know I, I'm a determined person. And you got to do what you got to do. But I want you to know I work harder than anybody. And he said, you know what? I'm going I'm to I'm continue to give you a chance. Start this week and let's see what can happen. He showed me grace in that moment, just like God would show you grace in your mistake. And what happened over the course of three years is... Our life group went from two students to 25 students. You know, it brought it back to life. We had, uh, I got chances to speak at the, some of their events that they had. You know, at this point, I saw, I got to have influence there because I didn't stay off course. I stayed on the course. I stayed determined. I stayed persistent through it. And let me tell you something. The biggest thing to get past the mistake sometimes is to just own it. So many of us, Never get past our mistake because we try to blame other people. Could you imagine if Joshua would have tried to fight that and be like, you know what, I'm not fighting this. Gibeon, you put yourself into it. And just walked away from that. He'd have never saw a miracle. That's what we do in mistakes we make. We think that if we don't own them, we run away from them, and everything will be good. But the way you get past that addiction is realizing that you do have an addiction. Own it. The way you realize you get past debt is you realize you got a lot of debt, a lot of debt, and now it's time to make a plan to get past it. You realize that there are things that need to change in your life. You own it, and you move on from it. If I want to move forward in my life, I can't be held back by my own mistakes. i got to realize that I have a God of grace that's fighting on my side, and i got to realize he'll turn my mistake into a miracle if I would just believe him for the impossible thing, if I would have the audacity to believe, because then the beautiful thing happens. Then the... The great thing happens. You see, when you continue a life with audacious faith, you're going to see that your sun stand still prayers, they turn into sun stand still moments. 
Sun stand. I want you to catch that. I know the team's coming up and stuff, but your sun stand still prayers. When you have the audacity to continue to believe God for the impossible, to continue moving forward, you would realize something. You would realize that your sun stand still prayers, your impossible prayers, they turn into sun stand still moments. What are sun stand still moments? What is that? Let's try to say that five times fast. What are sun stand still moments? What is that? Sun stand still moments are the praise report. It's the moment where the sun stands still over your situation and you see God come through. It's the moment that addiction's broken. It's the moment that we had two brothers in here that didn't talk for 26 years and then restored a relationship with one another. It's the moment that cancer has been healed. You know, for us as a church, every time somebody lifts their hand for salvation, it's a sun stand still moment. Every time somebody's baptized in the water and raised to new life in Christ, it's a sun stand still moment. I see this and I believe that in your life if you would learn to believe God for the impossible you would start to see those moments happen in your life on the regular you would start to see a faith in you like you've never had before because you know God's fighting with you and let me tell you something being a Christian doesn't mean all things are going to be good all the time life still happens things still go on and, and the truth is the truth is Life can just weigh you down. It can weigh you down. It can get you so frustrated. It can get you so mad. It make you want to quit because sometimes big things and moving towards big things means big fights, means big obstacles. And it gets so exhausting and it gets so tiring. And I know where you are right now. I felt that before. You've heard some of my story before where I told you where even in this journey where I felt like I wanted to quit, want it to be done with and I know where you are right now when you feel complacent you feel stuck but I remember praying for God to have this audacity inside of me boldness you know Proverbs says that the bold will walk like a lion just be bold like a lion and I, I love when I think about that I just want to be bold for Christ I want to be bold for him and so I started believing God for big things and started being thankful for what he was doing because let me tell you something a lot of times if you look all the way at the destination of where you want to go you're going to miss the little things God's doing all around you and I guarantee you that in your life right now God's doing all kind of things around you he's working in your favor he's throwing hailstones down on something right now and if you would see it through his perspective you would understand that he's working for your glory he's working to glorify himself because you're going to see him doing incredible things in it. And our church, I think about our church, and I'm like, you know, a church isn't a building. A church isn't the organization. We obviously have to have a name, but the church, Church on the Mission, it's every person in here right now. It's the people sitting in this place. And it's these people right here that have called, been called into mission by God to believe big things. So when we look forward to the future as a church, we want to believe God for the impossible. We want the sun to stand still over Church on the Mission and over the city of New Orleans because this city has been known for too long to be evil, to be people who are so far away from God that he just need, maybe he just needed a 24-year-old punk to stand up here and say, God's not done with you yet. I'm ready to go forward. I'm ready to push forward. And I'm ready to get a group of people to reach this city like never before. Look, when I'm praying impossible prayers, I'm not praying to have a large church. I'm praying to have revival in this city. I'm praying to see people come to know Jesus that you would never think to know Jesus. That you would look them on the street and you'd be like, man, this person's probably so far from God, but they got a fire in them that loves him so much. That's what we're praying for. We're praying for revival. We're praying for God to do great things as a church. And then your life personally, God will work in your life and do miracles. Stay the course. Don't let mistakes dictate the level of audacity that you pray with. Pray big prayers. Don't be scared for you. Look at your need. Look at your future. Is it intimidating to you? If it's intimidating to you, then you're right where you need to be right now. So start relying on God. Always pray sun stand still prayers. And you notice that word though, always. Remember how I told you audacity is not an activity, it's an approach. We can't live a life where we want to have audacity sometimes. We got to live a life always believe in God for big things that even when it looks like we're backs against the wall and we 
we're not going to get through this situation. We're always praying for the impossible because that's the God that we serve.